Welcome back, loyal fight fans, to Unboxing. Open those presents up. This is Unboxing brought to you by Christmas. So please hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up button. And if you know a friend, a family member, or a crazy ex girlfriend who enjoys combat sports, please tell them about this show. They'd probably enjoy watching this show as well. So we have like a special kind of Christmas episode, and I figured. This was a good a good time to do it. We 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 we're gonna talk boxing, of course, but uh, we were off last week. We're gonna jump right into the fights that had happened uh, that that we did miss um, covering, and I'm gonna do a little special for you guys today of uh, lightweight rankings. Considering that we've seen you know the great lightweights at it, we've seen you know George Cambosis defeat uh, Tiafima Lopez, and we saw. Uh, Devin Haney defeating Jojo Diaz, uh, Vasily Lomachenko making his huge return, Tank Davis in an absolute war with Isak Cruz. Um, we've had some really good ones, and it's the end of the year, start of 2020 coming to you soon, and I figured that we're gonna we're gonna do our own lightweight rankings here. We're gonna really dive deep into it because it's you know I, as any boxing fan is, I'm a huge huge fan of the lightweight division. There's lots of names to be thrown in there. I hear rankings. I think mine are a little bit different. Everybody has their own, so mine might match some, but you know, certainly of the major promoters, things like that, that give you um, their top five rankings. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do top five and we're going to include some honorable mentions in there. And also I'm a big believer that you kind of got to have two lists going, but we're going to get into that first. Let's jump right in and recap uh, the fights that we had missed that, that had happened already. So we had Vasily Lomachenko back in action, defeating Richard Comey. Um, we lost on the over-under there. Over-under was, I believe, eight and a half rounds. Uh, he could have got him out of there, possibly even in that second. Not, it wasn't a lot of time. It's possible he could have got him out of there in the second round. It's very very just easily doable that he could have got him out of there in the seventh round. So that's not up for debate. Um, he could have done that. The only debate to be had is should he have gone in and finished his job as a professional or was it too much taunting kind of a showboating thing? But it, it was in a more classy way, trying to get um, Richard Comey's corner to stop the fight because he had taken a lot of abuse. And if you look at his legs... You know, his right leg there was just like, I don't know how he was standing because it was his foot instead of being flat was just scraping along with his whole leg sideways along and, until he got to the ropes because he was so out of balance from being hurt um, just after getting dropped, getting back up. He just looked a mess. Um, and so uh, Vasily Lomachenko is looking to his corner and says, hey, man, you guys got to stop. Look at him. Look at his legs. You got to stop this fight. Now, I enjoyed it. But was I yelling at the TV screen up in the mountains with my friend and my daughter? It's possible. It's, it's, it's humanly possible that I was yelling at the TV screen that, hey, he should get in there because of my over-under. But uh, the debate is not to be had about how great that performance is, how great of a fighter, you know, Vasily Lomachenko still is. Coming out of a number one pound for pound spot. You know, they gave Canelo that spot quickly after afterwards, but uh, he was just, he was a lot of people's pound for pound number one fighter. Um, he is one of my favorite fighters, but I'm not biased here. I'm going to get, I give you guys the facts. Like I just told you, it's debatable that he should have went in there and did his job and stopped the guy because that's his job. And it's, the, it, it's, it's Comey's own corner and the referee's job to look out for the safety of the fighter, you know, the referee's job to look out for the safety of both fighters. Um, but yeah, that's that's a debate to be had, but the, the level of performance of this guy is just unreal. You know, he's 33 years old, so he's not a young man, especially for those lower weight classes, and he's just an absolute world destroyer. I, I get a little bit frustrated that people um, just kind of throw him out after the, the Lopez defeat. Now, I was okay with it because of the of, and we've touched on this before, because of what Lopez was able to do, really stamping it and, and deserving getting that victory in that last and final 10 or 12th round. Because prior to that, you know, Vasily Lomachenko just started that fight with this strange strategy. I'm not even going to buy into him saying that his shoulder was injured. That's a possibility for sure. But we don't know. 
We don't know for sure, you know, how much the shoulder was, was in there. So just, you want to make a debate that it wasn't his shoulder, throw that out. It's strange that the guy's not throwing punches, is it not? For five rounds straight, you know, five rounds straight, he just gives it up. So you would figure the fight's at a loss. But no, when he starts letting his hands, it's not like we're having a debate of could he have let his hands go more in that fight with, uh, you know, Teofimo Lopez. No, of course, he could have let his hands, because we saw him let his hands go more in that same fight after giving up those first five rounds. And we saw him win round after round after round consecutively. Um, you know, if he takes that final round, that's definitely at least a draw. That's not debatable. You could say that he should have won the fight if he took the 12th round. But I ended up being okay with this due to only the fact that Tiafimo really put the stamp on it and stopped the comeback there in that 12th round. Um, so, but that's touching on an old fight. I just get a little mad how you throw the guy out after a loss um, that was extremely competitive. More, it was just about, oh, look at what Tiafima Lopez was. Hey, man, that was an incredibly close fight. And how do you not think about that fight? Number one, as how strange is it the one guy wasn't throwing punches for half the fight, huh? You know, so I, I, that's always made me a little bitter. He's back with a vengeance. You know, he came back, stopped Nakatani, who gave Tiafima Lopez a hard-ass fight. Um, and Nakatani had also never been stopped by anyone. And Vasily Lomachenko stopped him, uh, like double the reach uh, advantage for Nakatani in that fight, stopped him. Now he defeats former world champion Richard Comey, who Tiafima Lopez originally got that first belt from right before uh, the fight with Lomachenko. So he's looking good. Uh, Xander Zayas looking great on that undercard. Re real good uh, Puerto Rican prospect there. That kid's young as hell. I that kid's not old enough to drink yet. I don't think. Um, and he is just a he is just he's something else, man. He's got a lot to learn. But look at how goddamn young he is. He is so young, and the the way that he's able to perform in there, the things that he already you can tell is it's not just relying on athletic gifts, which he does have. Um, it's, it's listening and learning really from his coach. His, he gets better and better after each fight. Um, he had a great fight. Um, and then we did have, uh, you know, real quick, we did have the, the Muhammad Ali's grandson. I thought he, I thought he could have, you could have said he lost that fight really. I mean, at, at bare minimum, that should have been a draw. So, but we've talked about that before as, as, as well on the show as, as the, uh, you know, former world champions, former Hall of Fame fighters that have sons or daughters that then start boxing. And it usually doesn't kind of work out well. I'm a big believer that Conor Ben's the only one that will work out uh, uh, to possibly having a historic, you know, boxing career, um, even if he takes losses. I just think he's built for this game. Um, and, and some of these other guys like the can't, uh, Ricky Hatton's kid, um, you know, and, and, uh, um, uh, who was the other one? Tommy Morrison's son, and 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 then now Muhammad Ali's grandson's kind of reaching with the name. You gotta evaluate the guys as you see how they fight because you're you're overvaluing just the name factor of it. Um, he's Muhammad Ali's daughter's son, um, so that was his grandfather. But you just you know that sells in the pay per view. Say hey, people, he's he's a he, people want to come to see him because of that name. Um, he's got a lot to learn though. He's got a lot to learn. Uh, we had Jared Big Baby Anderson, uh, cr another crazy knockout. That guy's just, uh, you know, a an absolute devastator at heavyweight. Um, and he's going to be one of those names that can get thrown in there. Making boxing real fun. Just bringing it to life. He's another great heavyweight to look out for. He came out walking like a pimp in a pimp outfit with a cane and a limp. A real great, a great showman. Um, but actually, I've heard that the guy's a really good guy as well. Really good guy. Um, and Nonito Donaire, Tommy Tux, his opponent, for this show. Because you know we're suckers for that Tommy Tuck, dude. And he Tommy Tux, his opponent, that left to the liver. You know it's nasty when the guy takes a knee. He's there because he got hit to the body, not the head. He's not disoriented. He's hurting. He's writhing in pain in his body. He takes the knee so good. He's all there mentally, and he's looking at the referee. Okay, you're counting him. Wait for the eight count. Try to get a little, okay, there's the eight count. Gets back up and immediately is just, his body forces him. Nope, you're not doing this. Back down to the knee. 
Um, that's vicious. That's vicious. And Nonito Donaire, you know, God, if it wasn't for Manny Pacquiao, he would be he would be Manny Pacquiao. He would be the legend of the Philippines because Nonito Donaire, and I mean, his career in general is great. And what he's doing at this older age is just fantastic. What the hell is in the water in the Philippines? I don't know because, you know, you got Manny Pacquiao just and, and, and Nonito Donaire boxing late into their careers, late, late, way later than fighters should stay as far as just the number, the age goes. Uh, and they just, they just prove it's like, ah, you don't really, except for Pacquiao's last fight, a little bit. You saw him slowing a little bit, still didn't get finished, still made it, you know, and, you know, enough of a, of a fun enough fight. He was trying in there, God bless him the whole time. But Nonito, Nonito Donaire just looking absolutely phenomenal. That's a great win to put under his belt yet again at this, at this uh, later stage of his career. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, uh. There was crazy UFC stuff. We don't have so much time to dive. But Amanda Nunes, the greatest female fighter of all time, took a loss to Juliana Pena. No one, you know, no one saw that coming. No one, you know, had enough uh, belief in that in that fight actually turning out that way to put any sort of money on it. And that is why Amanda Nunes is such a favorite. Everybody's, you know, scared of her in that in those fem those females in that division. Um, Really, and she's running, was running out of contenders to fight that. This now you got a new name in there. And listen, if Amanda beats her and they don't put in her in with uh, Kayla Harrison or something, you could always run it, it back because if you're struggling for names, you have somebody, even if she comes back in the rematch and beats Jessica Pena, uh, you, you, she still has that win over, so you can do the rubber match that way. Um, and so it'll be good for that division. It'll be good for the fighters. It'll be good for those girls that are fighting in that weight class that that happened. But yeah, no one saw that coming. Um, that definitely uh, was a bit of a ruin on a little parlay I had going there. But um, yeah, fantastic performance. Um, and uh, and Charles Oliveira, we did call that one as a fun one, as your fun underdog pick. That came through. So if you listen to that, you made some money at least on that. Um, and uh, yeah, that, then we had Arthur Betterbeef. Um, Arthur Betterbeef taking on Marcus Brown. This this was a fun fight to watch because Betterbeef is a monster at that weight class. You know, he is now uh, seventeen and zero with seventeen KOs. You know, um, in uh, in those heavy heavy weight classes, he's he's phenomenal. He's always been a guy that I, that Canelo's talked about moving way up to fight. You know, at, at light heavyweight, I think that he, I've always been, a, you know, of, of the mindset that he shouldn't do that um, against Better Be if the, the scary Russian um, who's just made of granite. Now, this fight, he was supposed to run over Marcus Brown and actually gets cut viciously. A huge cut. I mean, it's the size of his entire forehead. I'm not sure that I've seen many fights that can live up to that kind of blood all over the ring, all over their clothes and their gloves and their bodies. And just, I mean, the referee was absolutely covered in blood just from being around this guy. I have to separate them a little and being a ref doing referee things in there was just, he was soaked in their blood. Um, and, and so better be with this massive cut in a horrible place, just right over his whole forehead, the length of it. He was just looked like a monster leaking out of his face. The referee actually comes over. The doctor's looking at it. They decide one more round. They, they literally say that. We give him one more round to try this thing because of how great it is. That's it. We're going to call this off. And better be if just turns it on. It is a championship mentality. You know, I don't want to say undervalued the, his opponent. His opponent was in there trying to headbutt him afterwards in the cut and just do anything that he could do um, against this absolute beast. But once they told him one more round, that's all we give you. He didn't just go out there and Ooh, win the round. So let's play. No, man, he went and immediately turned it on, turned it on super hard, um, worked the body of Marcus Brown and got him the hell out of there, leaking everywhere. Didn't just win the fight, but another stoppage. He's all KOs. He's nothing but KOs. He's a scary Russian. And, uh, you know, the fact that he got cut and the fact that you could say he lost some of those, you know, earlier rounds there, um, 
is is you know I, I forget if the fight turned the fifth or sixth round is when it really turned for uh, better beef but before that it looked like what the hell is happening here is he gonna lose uh, so I will say if you're a Canelo fan that looks bright to you you know that's a bright spot um, for him facing better beef someday but uh, still the way the guy was at, I mean that's 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 that somewhat says more that you can be cut like that, that you can be hurt like that, that you can be leaking so bad that you it's impairing your vision drastically. It's impairing you in all sorts of ways in the fight. You're, the blood is just soaking the mat, your opponent, the referee. Um, and just to turn it on like that and get the stoppage, not just do enough, but become an absolute animal who is not scared, who will take more shots in that cut and get that stoppage. Um, he was like a machine. And that's the kind of person that I'm still going to say, um, although it looks better than it had, it may be a little a little bit that Better BF is, is getting a little old in the tooth to where Canelo can kind of sneak in there and kind of Mayweather the, the situation a little bit. It'll be an interesting fight. Um, that makes it more interesting because really very possible that Canelo still loses to that guy, honestly. That's just too big. It's not, the guy's great, better be if it's great, um, but I'm an enormous Canelo fan. But he is the pound for pound number one boxer and there's no question about that. Um, but I'm just simply saying, you know, as a big Canelo fan who I would root for Canelo, I just think that that weight class is a little big and, uh, you know, he was Kovalev when he fought Kovalev there. The one time he was at that weight class, you know, Kovalev was actually able to put a little bit of work on him, stay away from him. And he's using his, his, his reach, his, his, his size in general. Even he was able to do it. And he's no Archer better be if. No Archer better be if. So that one worries me still a little bit. Derek Chisora taking on Joseph Parker. This was a fun one. Um... I watched this fight over a couple times because they actually, you know, think, man, they love uh, Derek Chisora in England. I mean, I'm a fan of him, too. He's, he's just a cool guy, um, eats burgers with his opponent afterwards, but in there is just looking to land bombs, uh, kind of Yoel Romero's people, if you're an MMA fan, a bit where he'll let them come in, come in, and then he throws his own barrage when just when you think... He's going to be overcome here. He'll start throwing his own barrage, screaming in his opponent's faces. He's a cool, he's a cool guy. He's a character. So I see why they love him there. But they love him maybe a little too much. The fight was very fun to watch. But was it so competitive? I don't know that I can give Chisora that many rounds. Not to mention that Chisora was dropped three different times in this fight. Um, you know... Yeah, it's it's tough. He then he walks to every time after he got dropped, he walks over to the corner and sits in the corner and just is puts himself in the corner and is waiting, which is kind of smart a little bit. Um, you know your opponent's gonna come after you, and there you don't have to worry about moving or the angles they'll take. You're just in your own corner, and he just sits there, kind of like a rabid dog waiting to land a big shot. And man, he actually got one off a couple times in that corner like that. Um, he made it a real fun fight, but if, again, if we don't get swept up in the moment here and say, just because it was a fun fight, just because the guy's cool and he's a good character for boxing, let's almost, let's say that he almost could have had that fight if he didn't get dropped. I still don't think so, and he did get dropped three times, but very fun fight, fun to watch. Interesting where he'll go next. He's always going to pack the seats in there. Derek Chisora is a very cool guy, always with the mask before COVID, always with the mask on, uh, the bandana, the Br British bandana, um, and the little, you know, boxer beanies, which your boy himself likes. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, fun stuff. And then we had Doc one, the Jake Paul Tyron Woodley too. Your boy is going to be going for Jake Paul here unless he fights like you know, even possibly a Nate Diaz, dude. I hate to say, but that's iffy. And if he fights Jorge Masvidal, I think Masvidal viciously K doesn't just win, but Mark Mo viciously KOs him in the way that Jake Paul KO'd Tyron Woodley in the second fight. Vicious right hand, 
good stuff because the fight was very boring before that. That's very true. It was very boring, but not to touch on this that long. It's just that the guy has a kind of a gimmick here, okay? So his whole thing is that he's going to post stuff. Um, he's going to he's gonna post his Instagram clicks, his, his, little, his little videos he does or on any kind of social media platform, his YouTube stuff. He's going to always just put in interviews, anything, him kind of trash talking a bit, him putting on a show, a facade. You've never seen him, you know, he doesn't post his own like, oh, look at me, like really sparring and learning stuff. Look at me being taught how to do things. He's not posting like, look at how much I'm running every morning. Look at all the work that I'm putting in. Because he purposely wants to keep that behind the scenes, which is very smart. It is very smart. It's smart because you hate him. Because you hate I don't like the guy either, but I'm just saying, you don't know him. Like, I don't know. I know more than you about him. I do. I know more than you. Because you just hate him. And you think that he's just an idiot because you buy into and believe everything that he says acting like an idiot or trash talking in these interviews and on his own social media platforms. Get, you buy into it. The real Jake Paul, none of us know, but I know is a different guy than that. Whether he's still kind of a dirtbag or whether he's really a nice guy, it's irrelevant. He's not that guy that he's putting on all these interviews and on social media and all of the things that you and I see. That's not the guy. The guy that you're seeing in those boxing matches is a guy who has truly dedicated himself to learning boxing who has not gone into this thinking, I'm the shit, and sure, I'll work out a little, and then I'll take this match. That is not him. He is coming into boxing very humbled, which he would love for you to never know. He's coming in very humbled because he's willing to learn anything that he can from expert fighters and trainers and gets good sparring sessions in where he, you, I know... He's getting his ass whooped in those sparring sessions. They're just working him. And he's putting himself, no need for the money, more money than God. He's putting himself in these scenarios to truly learn the craft and to be humble, come into it humble and learn to be as good as he can be and as prepared as he can be uh, to really get in real fights in a boxing match. And then... The caveat to that is that he also is taking MMA fighters who were previous world champions, Tyron Woodley, twice Ben Askren. They were previous world champions in MMA. There's something you guys need to understand. I'm a fan of, of MMA as well. Um, but there's something you guys need to understand. When MMA fighters, they train boxing, right? We all know that. They train boxing and they train wrestling. And, but when they learn boxing, right? They don't learn traditional boxing. When an MMA fighter is going to get sparring in, right? Or, or, be, or hit the pads with boxing gloves on where that training session isn't wrestling or Muay Thai or kickboxing or jujitsu or anything like that, it is boxing training, they're being taught differently, and rightfully so, because they're going to end up competing in a sport that is different. A sport where you can be kicked in the leg, or you don't want your leg exposed even if not for the kicks because you're leaving it open to, for takedowns, things like that. So there are certain um, pivots, right, and head movement that you see in boxing, angles, that you, you don't see it in MMA, even from high class strikers, you know, like an Israel Adesanya, like a, like a Max Holloway, like any of these guys, you don't still, you don't see it on that kind of level and you don't see it being utilized the same way for a reason, that's because they're taught different. They're not taught traditional boxing. So Jake Paul knows I'm a novice, but I have put in some years now in gyms where I have enough money financially to um, 
learn from the greatest trainers to hire great boxers to spar with me and teach me things as well, to get the best kind of work in, to have a dietitian that can get me right on point and just make the most of everything financially, He's able to start in a way that most people are not and kind of make way more out of two, three years of doing this than a normal person who's not a millionaire. You understand? Um, in every aspect because of money. So he's able to fast track that a little bit. And so, but he knows I'm still not going to be like the Tommy Fury fight. I want to see that. That's perfect. Tommy Fury's not got a huge record, but he's got the name of Fury attached to Tyson Fury. It's his brother, his cousin, whatever it is. Um, that's an interesting one, though, because his record's not all fantastic. He's only had a few pro fights. That's a perfect... I want to see that one um, to determine just kind of where he's at as far as actual boxing. But his whole facade is to really just make you want to hate him and say, how's this guy winning? This guy's an asshole. He's not training like these real fighters. He is training like these real fighters. And not just that, he's training like real boxers. Um, and he's using more kind of washed up older names from a different sport, you guys. It's a different sport. You guys, the striking, what I'm saying is, the stri it's not different just because of the wrestling and jujitsu. Now you can kick the leg. It's taught differently than traditional boxing. The striking aspect of mixed martial arts is taught differently than your traditional boxing. You can't, so Jake Paul takes these little edges that he can have, little edge and, and that I'm a millionaire, I can, I can make more out of two or three years of training hard and learning things than most people because of that. So I can fast track myself as much as possible in that way. He's taking uh, ex-champions, but ex-champions that are older, a little washier and saying, I'm gonna use that slight edge that they're a little past their prime there. They've come off of some losses now. They're getting out of the UFC just now. Um, and I'll take, so that'll be another little step that I have. Then he has size. He's, they're always smaller, right? That's another thing. And then so it's like, so that'll benefit me. And then he's taking the boxing that he's, cle he's just boxing. He's not worried about wrestling or jujitsu, which is something these other guys have to devote time into. And even the boxing that they do devote time into, they can't do it. They can't learn it in the same way as just purely boxing. So he's taking all of these slight little advantages and they compile together to make it where he's able to win these fights. And he, he gave Tyron, Tyron Woodley a great look to the body. So he looks down physically with his eyes, he looks to the body, right? And then he, he dips himself down while throwing. He dips down, so I'm looking and I'm dipping down like I'm going to your body. And then he just comes over top. Right, and then he just comes over top instead of down below, and just spark Tyron Woodley, flips face first, face first down onto the onto the thing. They stop it right away because referees are taught to stop it right away. There's no need to give a ten count when someone goes face first like that. They knew he was out cold. It's stupid, and I'm not going to touch on it to say it's fake. No, it's just set up in the way that I explained. Uh, there's no th then they then they just get in there. Then they get in there and he takes his chances like other people do. Um, that's so stupid. I don't want to hear that. That's a stupid thing to say and it's not worth my time.